Friday afternoon in downtown Honolulu here, folks. Ted Ralston here hosting our show, Where the Road Leads, uh, on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, with me in the studio, Mike Elliott. He's a former victim of this show. Uh, Back on again. Thanks, Ian. Must like it or something. No, appreciate it. Uh, having a great time talking about some of the technology. And thanks again for having me on board. Cool. And in uh, California, standing by in San Diego, we have uh, Punahou graduate Dave Place. Uh, retired out of the Navy and 20-year veteran of uh, many forms of uh, development in the UAV world. Dave, welcome on board and uh, to our show here. Thank you very much, Ted. Hi, Mike. Hey, how you doing today, Dave? Good. So, what we've done and <coughs> turned this show into almost like a public service activity on behalf of the emerging world of UAVs and unmanned systems in general and how they affect life in Hawaii, the invasive species management, uh, 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 weather uh, aspects of the search and rescue and things that you're involved exactly. in, Mike. And then, and then Dave represents uh, where the future is in this business, having had those 20 years in the, in the past and looking forward to the 20 years in the future. So we'll keep using this show to bring new technology and new developments and new awareness and new rules and regulations and operating procedures to the public so they can get, a, get an idea, with, idea of what's going on and give people who uh, might be out there in the audience who want to be part of this, uh, give us give them a chance to come on and, and talk about something that, that they know about or think about or would like to, like to hear about. So we got some hardware on the table here. We'll get into that in a minute. But uh, first, I wanted, once again, just to welcome you guys uh, to the show as we close out the week here. So, um, Mike, you've been on the show before. Uh, talk a little bit about how fast things are moving in the world that you are dabbling your toes in at this point in time, which is commercial uh -huh. drone operations here in Hawaii. It's, <clears throat> it's actually starting to grow. We're getting uh, more and more calls. We have some different uh, jobs that we have. Um, some of the jobs, we, the, uh, the information or what we provide uh, to the individuals and stuff is, is kind of close hold for projects that they're doing. So we in, uh, have signed uh, NDAs for release of information. They basically have shared it only with the, uh, the customer themselves so we don't talk about uh, the post product. Uh, We've done some volunteer work uh, with uh, various uh, entities here in the islands. We're looking at a possible another one. Uh, Charles Devaney was uh, um, approached by some uh, individuals supporting local Native Hawaiian projects. I think is something that uh, you know is a, is a no-brainer for us to do for uh, uh, for free. Basically, we have some uh, various tools with some of the drones we have, and also some of the software tools. Well, tell we us have. a little bit about the number of and types of drones you've got available to for people to hire and use and get something done. So um, we have uh, uh, some of the basic ones that most people are very familiar with, uh, you know, with the uh, Phantoms and Spires, uh, Steady Drones that we have with uh, some of the Maverick series. That, uh, we're also getting some that uh, have the IR cameras here shortly. So basically you have uh, true color and infrared is the methods of uh, inventory collection. Some options that we have available, right. And uh, we also, like I said, we do builds for customers. Uh, it's uh, very customized. Obviously, uh, depending on what the need is, and obviously you've got something here on the table that uh, you know falls within a niche and a need, uh, all the way up to some large heavy lift drones. Uh, one of our uh, or one of our uh, dealers that we have, or manufacturers that we have, just recently announced a drone that can lift uh, 55 pounds, which exceeds the FAA <laughs> limit. So uh, right now we cannot use that maybe particular one. But here. you've got a lot of equipment. You've got a lot of. Uh, but the thing I'm most impressed is you got the software backing you as well. You've got the analytical software in that operation called Propeller you told me about. Right, so that's a, a new app that we uh, just recently took on board uh, with a uh, developer in Australia. It's called Propeller. It's a cloud-based uh, drone application service. You can basically buy the credits that you need to uh, for the number of acres that you utilize. Somebody will do the analysis offline for you? Through the uh, it can be. Uh, it can be done for you, or you can do it yourself. Uh, there is just a tremendous amount of uh, uh, capability and power that's there. They're adding new features all the time. Uh, and if uh, you have any questions on that, you can but that's contact the, us. That's the part that's cool. So the, the system is actually producing useful information for people who have not had that access before and you're providing both the system to collect the information and a system to analyze it and produce results for them in whatever form they might want. Right, so it's we a have complete a service. 3D point cloud capability within there. You can uh, actually build a 3D image from just regular photographs you uh, can take with a very simple drone. And uh, if you follow the right pattern of flight and taking the images, you can actually get a very, very detailed uh, analysis of an area that you're trying to look at for uh, construction, for uh, um, 
like I said, we talked about the uh, invasive species, but just uh, general uh, forestry management. Uh, there's just so much that you can do when you have the, uh, the software piece of it uh, along with the drone with the hardware. And, hardware piece. and this has all happened in the last six months. Oh, yeah. And there's yeah. been some tools that are out there. There's other programs, other software. Uh, Pix4D makes a great one. It's one that uh, a lot of people default to, but it's a very expensive software to own. Uh, it takes a long time to learn how to operate it properly. Uh, so there's others that are utilizing similar capabilities, but they're putting in them in a format that is more like an app that people are more familiar with and can easily manipulate and get what they need. So this is, again, this is a rapidly emerging, uh, it's now becoming user-oriented with a lot of functionality beyond just flying airplanes and flying drones. But, right. and, and Dave Place, who's online here, uh, if we still have Dave, there he is. Dave, this is what you caused to happen over the last 20 years. I, I wonder in your, as you look back at your 20 years of uh, pushing this through in industry and agency and the military and such, if you've ever thought we'd see this day where Mike is sitting here providing a full service to users who need it, uh, who may not have had that access before, and how can they can do their business better, whatever it may be, by virtue of this incredible capability. It, and this has just happened in the last couple of years. What's your thoughts, Dave, on how fast, uh, how that has actually occurred? <clears throat> well, first of all, I have to preface all my comments with the fact that while I'm a government employee, anything I say are, <laughs> are strictly my personal opinions and observations over having been in this industry for the last 20 years. Uh, so anything I say is not necessarily uh, the positions of the Naval Postgraduate School whom I work for or the Third Fleet Commander where I actually sit here in San Diego or any other government agency for that matter. So I just need to get that out up front. But uh, you, you're bringing up some real good points. So if we if we re go back in time about 20 years, I was the uh, commanding officer of the Navy's only UAV squadron. So we were flying pioneers <laughs> off the battleships and the uh, amphibious ships. In fact, there was an, one instance that you can, you can Google it on YouTube and there's a video from CNN of a, the Iraqis in the first Gulf War actually waving their white flag, surrendering to a, <laughs> to a drone. A drone. Yeah, I prefer to call them unmanned aircraft systems or RPVs, but any, regardless. Uh, so I most certainly foresaw, otherwise I wouldn't still be in this business, I kind of anticipated the maturation and the technology development that would facilitate um, a lot more capability, but I was thinking more along the larger unmanned aircraft systems or the RPAs as the Air Force calls them. But what you're asking about, I did not really envision that you would have, we'd have these tremendous capabilities in such small platforms like your instant eye or like the, um, I meant to ask Mike, did, was that the, are you talking about the Prioria Maverick? Is that the Maverick you're talking about? No, uh, one of the uh, dealers or uh, product manufacturers, Steady Drone, they're made in uh, South Africa. They have a whole series uh, and they're more for uh, industrial professional use, uh, their Maverick series, and then also their Vader series, which is a heavy lifter, uh, really incredible product that they have. Uh, and you know, we have some folks here locally that are uh, exploring that for their companies that they're forming and utilizing that, uh, that technology. But combining it, like I said, with the software, the output piece is really where the, uh, the power of it is. And oh, well, absolutely. So the drone itself is just, as I tell people, it's just, it's a little truck. Exactly. In this case, little truck. <laughs> but the key components are the, the payloads and the software that are, uh, that provides the functionality and just tr provides this tremendous capability. Yep. So I happen to be additionally on the board of directors for the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. And uh, they saw the light several years ago and said, you know, we need to continue to support our warfighters, but we think there are a lot more applications. So the organization and all of its members are looking a lot more towards commercial and civil applications. So it's absolutely terrific that you're out there doing God's work, if you will, with the development and whatnot. Well, we're trying, we're trying to uh, show people. I think the biggest question that we get a lot of times is uh, what can it do? is the number one question whenever somebody new walks up and sees one of our drones or asks, well, what can it do? And uh, it's, like I said, it's the hardware, the software piece, but it's the myriad of uh, 
technologies or, or applications where you're applying something that affords you uh, low cost, uh, easy to use, you're not putting people's lives at risk, it's fast, you can get it into locations where normally you uh, might not have uh, an aircraft uh, of some type available to you, and a um, you know, quick turnaround. I mean, really quick turnaround on a lot of this stuff. And what's incredible is in this small little state of Hawaii, we've got Mike here with a complete business offering, and it's going to keep increasing in terms of capability as time goes on. I can hope so. Uh, <laughs> I will help all I can in that regard. But we've also got other folks who are specializing in like wedding photography, real estate photography, uh, mapping and such and on all the islands. So this, this little state alone, Dave, has a lot of commercial capability moving ahead in this kind of scale. And what, what struck me when hearing what Dave said about not uh, about paying attention to the bigger systems where AVUSI has all been, but that all the emerging of the small systems so rapidly, and what you're doing, it almost sounds like we need a industry day here or something where we rent the stadium or something and, and uh, you all come on down yeah. and well, uh, take I, a look. I did have, uh, recently was invited to uh, speak to the Hawaii Subcontractors Association and uh, basically give them a brief as to what we could do. Just like you said, the drone is a truck, and that's exactly how I referred to it. It's just a pickup truck bringing all the supplies to the, to the work site. You know, you, you just haul what you need. It's what you do with it um, at the end and what kind of payload or what type of tools you bring with you. So I was telling the guys, hey, you know, I'm sure all you guys have nail guns, you know, but you still have hammers. It's, it's just another tool that you add to the, um, what you're using. And then uh, the software piece, like I said, what you can do with it. I showed them a number of examples. And then, uh, you know, hey, you can incorporate this tool uh, into your business. And like I said, offer this as a service to save time, money, and uh, not put people's lives at risk. That's one of the great things about it. Let's do this. Let's take a break here for a moment, but when we get back on, let's tell people how to get a hold of you. And let's also tell people how to get a hold of Dave if they have questions about uh, where the past has been or where the future is going. And then we'll talk about that future and we come back from the break. Sounds great. Okay. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is our flagship show, which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. And the, uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important. And there's so many developments happening across the state. And we hope you'll tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. Wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon uh, that uh, we are talking about every Wednesday, 4 to 5, uh, we talk about some of the most important subjects that uh, are affecting the islands uh, now and into the future. Uh, energy, clean energy, we need it. Uh, we often run into uh, new ideas that we had not uh, thought about before. Uh, we did just today, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think we're going to have more of that uh, in the future. So uh, come on down and, uh, and watch us uh, 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, um, and we'll uh, see what happens. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. Friday afternoon, folks. Still Friday afternoon here in downtown Honolulu. Mike Elliott joining me here at the table at uh, Where the Road Leads at ThinkTech Hawaii. And we have Dave Place, uh, Punahou graduate Dave Place, I might say, uh, in place in San Diego and joining us by Skype. And uh, Dave's the first time around this show. Dave, I think we might have uh, made you try to remember the show sooner, uh, sooner than later. So <laughs> welcome aboard. And, uh, Thanks for joining us today, it, realizing it's after hours where you are. It didn't after hours here yet. Anyway, we've just been talking about the rapid emergence of the, the incredible growth and incredible capability in the world of small unmanned air systems, often mista uh, mistakenly called drones. And uh, we just wanted to show some of the pieces we have on the table here uh, to folks who might not be familiar with the actual reality here. We're not talking about big systems, Mike. We're talking about no. little systems and getting smaller, getting more capable, getting longer mission life. And uh, we're, we're just doing an experiment right here, folks, just to, to show you what we got. This is a standard uh, military issue uh, task force, special ops force type uh, uh, 
rotorcraft type uh, UAV. It's got three cameras on it. Its purpose is to uh, determine the conditions in the field ahead, behind, over, uh, around, maybe a quarter mile, half mile radius around a task force. And that information is uh, beamed down to a TV screen here that you can see that uh, I think the camera can probably see it. It's in the, there we go, that uh, uh, the cameras on board are seeing and pushing down. But we're still talking about something you have to carry. It's a little heavy and it's a little clunky. Mike, tell us about this development and what, how we might connect goggles, lightweight video goggles into a system like this. Talk about that sure. a little bit. So, uh, you know, this is uh, Thatchark, uh, one of the manufacturers, make a great set of uh, goggles. They're uh, extremely lightweight, uh, very popular with a number of uh, FPV racers, the uh, drone racers. Um, it just has a number of uh, fine features and stuff that, uh, and they last, and that's the other thing too. They're high quality product. So uh, basically you would uh, wear this set of goggles. Um, you'd have, uh, be able to receive the video signal uh, directly. So or you, you take this video signal to the ground station and pump sure. it over here to the, to the goggles so you don't have to carry this thing around. Right, or physically connect it uh, via cable. You could yeah. actually make a physical connection if you needed to. And uh, you sit there and just wear these. And it's the equivalent of eh, about looking at maybe a 60-inch screen TV. Uh, there's some adjustments for diopters, so if you uh, have glasses, you can make some slight adjustments to actually sharpen up the image for you. And uh, yeah, it has a, a battery that has it last for a pretty good while. Uh, but like I said, uh, extremely lightweight, um, you know, powerful tool, basically uh, removing the uh, uh, glare of the sun, but giving you a large field of view uh, while you're flying. So if you're flying this instant eye, for example, normally uh, the screen here is maybe, what, about eight to yeah. 10, 10 inches? Eight by eight. four. So very small, relatively small screen, but uh, useful. But if you can see a larger field of view, uh, while you're flying, you actually have a greater degree of perception of the, the area around you. So you're sort of able to almost like personalize the operation of this thing. It's, it's becoming more part of, your, part of your wearing gear as opposed to something you have to lug around. And giving you a little better connection with what's being visualized. And if we had a way to uh, take this system and respond to control inputs and position the, the UAV around in different places and change the orientation, we could have a, uh, uh, we'd have a, okay. Uh, we'd have uh, a yet another stage in the evolution of this small capability into a great utility for the part of the people who are out there in the field using it. Oh, definitely. And you could actually feed this information from here into your uh, uh, propeller analysis system. Right, so as long as you can record those images uh, and you know, like taking those photos yeah. and upload this information into uh, uh, into the propeller, uh, if you're doing a sm relatively small area, you can turn that around pretty quickly. Uh, if you're doing a relatively large area, uh, maybe a 24-hour turnaround on uh, data processing. So what it's doing is you upload those images, it's stitching them all together to make one seamless image. So within image. 24 hours, you can get the whole situation and something a lot tighter than that in time for something that's more... If it's smaller, you can, yeah. uh, you can get it uh, much quicker. And uh, I, I had one just the other day. It was Everything was done in just a couple hours. Oh, I think everybody uh, who's had experience with uh, hiring a service to go do something like that is thinking in terms of 30 days to put the contract in place and then maybe get the imagery or maybe you won't. And you put out an RFI to see who, somebody who can get out there and get it done. So we're talking incredible compression in time. Oh, uh, definitely. Relative uh, to what we and, have and today. It's for a power amazing company, for the... the uh, border water supply, the exactly. DNLR, for example. Right, so they could get out, uh, any of these folks get out and shoot in any of these areas, uh, upload their data, and then have the ability to do an analysis that normally uh, a survey team would uh, be involved in hiring surveyors to come out and uh, do that, um, be able to uh, get, build a 3D image and, like I said, look at it from different angles and see things that normally they wouldn't see, uh, slope analysis, uh, if they're looking for, you know, trying so to measure for runoff. So we're going to the people in the field with a lot more information than they've had before. Oh, definitely. So actually we're changing the way the social relationship works between command center and the distributed functions. So we have a large social training and education and uh, trusting learning activity to go through here as well. Sure, and the great thing about it being a cloud-based uh, application too is that you can actually uh, share it out to have others edit it. So you have a manager editor feature and then just a view only feature. So you could actually share this out with mm -hmm. anybody that's involved in the project without them having the software on their computer. Let me try something on Dave. Dave, I trust we still got you there. Um, you do. You know, uh, you and I met up at uh, GIFX, even though we jointly came out of a Manoa educational system here years ago at different times. 
But uh, the agent, the, the activity that, that uh, Dave is involved in a lot is JIFIX, the Joint Interagency Field Experimentation, which I've been going to for several years, my wife as well. And that's a, just a, it's a mash together session, taking things such as we're doing here, take this goggles and hook it up with this system, replacing or bypassing this system for a more functional overall and quicker responding uh, experience. And Dave, you know, from what we're seeing, what, we, what we're just talking about here and what you're seeing and, and this new awareness of the small scale, high capable systems that are now out there in the commercial world, you can hire Mike to go do it. How do we take this sort of level of capability and bring it into GIFIX? I'm just suggesting that maybe there's an, something we should be doing here about pushing this level of technology into GIFIX and working it backwards uh, into, the, uh, into the military line that we normally see there. What, what? Well, so I don't think I've seen, uh, they, I think we just finished the GIFX last week and there were 22 different experiments, uh, mostly industry types. There were folks here from Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, and then um, Lockheed Martin was there, AeroVironment was there. So you get a lot of the industry folks that are there, but the, the customer for those events are the uh, combatant commanders like Pacific Command, Northern Command, Central Command, and they are there just to observe uh, the various technologies that the industry folks are bringing. And in, in fact, I think they, there's a, a push right now for folks to submit proposals for the next GIFX, which will be next February up in Alameda. But the, the, the essence, science and technology folks that attend those events, they are just looking for these cool capabilities that they have not yet seen. I mean, if, if the, you know, not anybody can go, but most certainly you can submit your paper and you can come as a um, participant doing some experimentation stuff and get a fair amount of visibility. And, and, and then for the uh, civil, the civilian population, they can always go to an event like um, the exponential event that's coming up next May in New Orleans that's host sponsored by AUVSI. And there on the exhibit floor, you will see over 600 different exhibitors with all kinds of different um, control systems, goggles, platforms, payloads. And it's for all unmanned systems, not just air. But that's the, uh, and there's, they'll probably have over 7,000 attendees. So it's a good networking opportunity. It's a good opportunity to for the uh, civil and commercial folks to bring in their technologies uh, and it gets lots of good visibility. But back to your original question regarding the GIFX venue. Um, so how do you, uh, my question for Mike is how do you control the vehicle with those goggles? Oh well, no, you, uh, you don't. This one, this particular set right here is not uh, control, but just being able to see the output okay. on, a, on a basically as if you were looking at a large screen TV that you Excellent. obviously don't have available to you in the field. So it, it just right. puts it right there in your um, field of vision, also blocking out uh, the sun or any other distractions. Yeah, I got so. that part. So it's, it's just the, the visual enhancement. It doesn't, you can't actually control the vehicles by uh, head motions or anything. Uh, no, not but yet. I bet you that's not coming. yet. But that's uh, that's what yeah. we should. That's exactly the kind of challenge that you yeah. want to throw on this table here. Well, exactly. So uh, you know, there's, that's something obviously in the future. But as long as you're not swatting bees or anything, you're probably. probably I think be okay. there are uh, head motion sensors that'll actually move the camera on the they, vehicle. It will. Yeah. So there's the yeah. first stage yeah. of that's happening, Dave, and then the next stage would be a higher level of control uh, through some other means, other than these radios we're familiar with and ground stations. But that's the whole purpose yeah. of GIFX is to force that issue out and uh, get people to put things together overnight and fly them again the next day right. with more functionality added to so, it. So, uh, and Ted had seen uh, you know, our search and rescue drone that we were building. It's, uh, it's a weatherproof drone, uh, gimbal systems, waterproof, uh, multiple camera systems Alameda, that we can put on there. February of next year. Okay, well, we'll bring one. We'll surprise you. Yeah, and, and uh, that would be, that's the start of, uh, of this avenue of information from these small evolving systems into the larger the place where larger systems normally play, which don't necessarily have a, a view window into the small emerging capabilities, but you're all over the place with uh, uh, in, in actually in business. So the fact that there's, there's not just capability, there's a business model that works as well.
And that's the other thing that would be interesting for the GIFX uh, type operation to see that there's, this is a sustainable business. And, uh, you know, it's, we've been approached by a lot of different people. Commercial real estate is really big into utilizing drones. Um, we are in the process of partnering with a company uh, called LNG 3D that does, uh, builds 3D models uh, that allow you this. It's beyond what a video walkthrough is and uh, really amazing technology. So they want to incorporate uh, drones into that also with some of the technology that they have with some of the uh, 3D scanning capability and then to build these complete packages for, uh, for customers. For, and like I said, drones were just a natural fit and uh, we're going to be partnering up with them here in the very near future. Dave, what so, can, what so, can you, so oh. for your search and rescue vehicle, you need to find a small enough radar to make it all weather because it's just, just EO or IR then you really don't have all weather capability. But, and that would, maybe, that's the, maybe that's the next step. But I think that's yeah. the whole purpose of this discussion. Dave's been seeing this thing evolve for 20 years, and now he's looking at where the future is going to go. And we have GIFX as an example of how the future starts to be measured. And we have capability here. We need to tie them together. Let's talk about that and about getting you over to GIFX in February of uh, next year up in Alameda after the next break. That works. Thanks. Aloha. This is Kelee Akina, president of the Grassroots. Institute. And I want to thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii. We are delighted to be partners with Think Tech because it gives us the opportunity to bring to you a show every week on Monday at 2 o'clock p.m. called Ehana Kako. Ehana Kako means let's work together because we believe that Hawaii will be a better place when everybody works together. And in what way? Well, at the Grassroot Institute, we research three basic areas and we invite guests to come on board from across the country, the state, and the nation to talk about a better economy, a better government, a better society. Now, aren't those things we all want? Indeed. If you'd like to have the latest research in terms of public policy, as well as ways in which we can build a better government economy and society, then tune in every Monday on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock p.m. for our fascinating guests on Ehana Kako. Let's work together. I'm Kaylee Akina with the Grassroot Institute, and I'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha! How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy, every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Aloha. This is Reg Baker and I am the host of Business in Hawaii. We talk about positive stories, positive stories of businesses in Hawaii, how they have been successful, and how they have overcome some of the obstacles that a lot of us encounter when we try to have a business here. And believe it or not, there are a number of positive stories here, and we want to talk to all of you. So we broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, and it rebroadcasts again on Olelo Channel 54. So I sure hope to see you next time. Please tune in on Thursdays at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Friday afternoon, folks, downtown Honolulu. One more time, our last segment of our show, Where the Road Leads. Uh, today, we have Mike Elliott from Drone right. Services Hawaii. And we Thanks do need again. to put his contact information up there, uh, Zuri, if you will. And we have David Place in San Diego, in place in San Diego. We need to put your contact information up too, Dave, in case there's folks who want to get a hold of you. And we'll... Uh, talk for the next uh, segment of this show about, again, the idea of finding more and more ways to express this capability to the community at large for, for a socialization and to the community of users, which is the businesses and the, and, uh, the educational systems and such, and then even, even working itself backwards into the military, because I think that we're going to see continued uh, reduction in size, increase in power, longer duration, more reliable systems. And uh, uh, so the utility will continue to expand and grow of what we're speaking of here. Uh, Dave, what, what do you think the next couple of years are going to uh, show us in terms of the, where the technology is going to be going here? Well, that's, that's a real good question, Ted. The, um, I'm not pitching for AUVSI, but there, there's a foundation associated with AUVSI, and which... 
I've already said what that stood for. But so the foundation sponsors competitions, um, you know, and they're trying to focus on the STEM initiatives, starting with kids in grade school and then all the way through high school. For example, in the July time frame, the foundation hosts an event here in San Diego called RoboSub. And uh, the, the last, this past year, I think there were over 30 different teams of which probably maybe a handful were high school students, but then all the rest were college students from around the world. All different countries came in and they demonstrated how well they could build something to go underwater and, and uh, avoid different obstacles or search for different products. But so, so I think one of the key areas that we need to focus on, and Hawaii is a great place to do that, is the reaching out to, and trying to get the youth, the younger kids, because they're the ones that are going to be uh, flying the drones 10 years from now instead of Mike and I, so, or you too, Ted. So <laughs> we really need to focus on the educational side for the kids because, I mean, um, we, we run some evolutions and you throw it out to the younger generation and you'd be amazed, well, maybe you wouldn't, but with some of the ideas that they come up with on how to employ stuff and, and just all kinds of things. And since it's, you know, since we've gone into the more in the civil commercial space over the last five years or so, the, the opportunities are just endless. And I think Mike's doing a real good job on some of those applications. Well, you mentioned the, STEM too, and that's one of the things that is, uh, you know, early on with my partners, George Purdy and my wife, Ellen, that we wrote into our business plan and you know, that we believe obviously that you have to tie this back to education and work with some of these educational programs. Uh, and we want to uh, bring that to some of the school systems here. One of the reasons I think it's important is that when you uh, can broach technology that's fun, you can actually, uh, have kids learning and they don't even realize that they're learning math and science and engineering principles uh, how to deal with radio frequencies and, uh, and just all these different things that uh, aren't part of the normal curriculum but you can incorporate them in and uh, like you were talking about have these programs where there's competition so competition is good too and that that is uh, a, a bit of a nexus between like i said the education the technology and then uh, a competition event which can uh, bring all that together, and we'd like to see more of that here in Hawaii. Well, you know, that's a good point, and Mike and I are both, along with some others, are helping one of the UH groups here that's in engaging in one of these ABUSI competitions, uh, Dave. It will be taking place in Maryland next June, and it is all about basically a search and rescue preparation. Well, I was struck, I think we've all been struck by the challenges raised in those competitions and what that challenge does to the kids' thinking. I think it's fantastic. I'm not sure you're aware of it necessarily, Dave, but this is the I think the Seafarer group of uh, ABUSI in Maryland, and the challenge is to fly something like this in a half hour time period over about a half square mile area and pick up, uh, identify, characterize, geotag, and report on a number of targets that are placed on the ground that you have no knowledge where they are. All you know is the general shape that they might be. But unlike what we're speaking of, where the ground controller or the ground processor gets a chance to analyze that. It's got to be done on the fly, in the bird, by itself. That is, you get deductions for human involvement. If right. It's got to be totally autonomous. And this is an incredible capability. Dave, we're talking about onboard, real-time, autonomous feature extraction from either video or stills against an unknown set and distribution of ground targets that all you know is that they're polygons. And so this is an incredible challenge in the analysis area as well as the, the workflow architecture area. But that's, that's, that's where the future is going. And that's what's intriguing to me because we can take those things. There's already at university. We can take them into the K through 12 domains. Through, oh, exactly. Uh, yeah. We've got a, a, a program here at this table. We talked about it with Brendan Brennan at the university, uh, at actually a Janus group. And we're talking about with Lamai, a uh, educational program wrapped around STEM with UAVs as right. the driver and bringing in uh, educational architecture to figure out how best to generate critical thinking, which is the output. The UAVs get the benefit of it, exactly. but critical thinking is what you get when you right. come and that's what the it's And that's what it's all about. And then, you know, the, the thing is, too, here in Hawaii, uh, you know, myself, I wasn't born here. I lived as, here as a kid, uh, always wanted to come back. When you, when you live here your entire life uh, and you, you haven't seen some other areas or other places or you're a little, you know, somewhat isolated, um, 
exposure. It's all about exposure. And I think technology exposure is something that uh, offers uh, kids the opportunity to say, hey, maybe I want to pursue a degree in engineering and I want to build something that's like that or better. Maybe I want to, uh, you know, see what NASA has going on. And so I need to, you know, seek out a, a degree that will get me a job there. And it just, it's about opening the aperture, I think, sometimes uh, and making sure that that bridge of why am I going to school, um, yeah, which a lot of us probably asked, myself included at times, but why am I doing math? Why, am I, why is science, what does it matter? I think you have to tie it to technology and a career. And uh, I think this is a great way to do it and introduce it at, uh, like I said, lower levels all the way up to the college level uh, to show folks what is in the realm of possible and then let these guys go wild with what they can actually do with it and come up with things that many of us never even thought of. And you know, to that point, uh, going back to Dave's point about AVUSI having an interest in supporting education, Dave, we do have this, uh, this defined architectural plan for education coming forth here, uh, combining what the Department of Education wants, what the university has in terms of uh, resources to contribute to it, and to the thinking of how to put together a STEM program wrapped around UAVs, as I described. How do we get AVUSI involved in that? That is, right now it's at the university level, but we'd love to reach out and have ABUSI as part of this. Well, so if you contact uh, Daryl Davidson, is the executive director, director for AUVSI Foundation, and the foundation is the ones that are really, I mean, the entire organization is, is uh, trying to facilitate STEM initiatives, but the foundation is the one that's reaching out to particularly the younger folks. I mean, if you look at the competitions, because the competitions in Maryland have been going on for 20 years off and on, and 20 years ago it was just, can you stay airborne <laughs> long enough and do a launch and recovery successfully? And, and now today, as you pointed out, the, the challenges, the, the contest, if you will, is to identify, um, process, a ton more information that was, wasn't even dreamt about 20 years ago. But the other point that you, that you made, Mike, was trying to stay on top of this stuff. That is not easy because, no. in fact, uh, the Secretary of the Navy stood up two weeks ago and said he is the sponsor for a program called Cruiser, which really stands for something. Ted is a member already. It, but it's a consortium for robotics and unmanned systems, education, and research. And so when the secretary levels that high realize uh, the value of having a community of interest, and it's not just air, it's all, all domains, but what I end up doing is putting together a newsletter like once or twice a week, trying to capture, for example, articles from Wall Street Journal, Boston Globe, the Washington Post, you name it, Bloomberg, Defense One. So it's not all military related because right. there are a lot of civil commercial applications and it's just tough for anybody to, to capture all that. So what I try and do is capture some of that information in my newsletter and put that out to, to folks that are interested in this technology and the capabilities. Right. So the, the, exactly, the civil applications you know, I mean, are just tremendous. You know, the, uh, uh, agriculture, you know, one of the things that uh, had shown some folks in a, uh, a project is using um, hyperspectral and multispectral type sensors and where you can actually um, you know, fly over a crop, you could actually uh, determine where you maybe need to add an additional fertilizer or water a particular area. And, uh, you know, a farmer could do this uh, himself without having to hire somebody out, or the service could do this, but at a much lower cost. And then you target what you need, where you need it. Um, I was made aware of there's uh, another technology too that has uh, a pheromone sensors uh, for detecting insects. And the thought being, why couldn't you put a pheromone sensor on a drone and instead of uh, putting pesticides over an entire 40 acres, it's only over here in this one spot. That's where the infestation right. is. So yep. you target it. The farmer's saving money, uh, those pesticides aren't getting into the environment, and they're not getting into the, uh, into the food chain with, uh, with the general population. Well, and, the, and as you point out, I mean, in all of those things I've heard of, and uh, I haven't seen them all operate, but, but clearly there's lots of applications. I mean, you, so a ranch, a big rancher on the big island has a ranch, and he, 
as it fenced. Well, it's a lot quicker to fly a drone or a UAV around the fence line to see if there's any breaks or anything, for, you know, just for example. But I mean, the applications really are, are just phenomenal. And I think the more systems that are out there, in some cases, the farmers though, if depending on the cost of the system you're talking right. about, they are better off to hire somebody or to a service right as a service right. is provided but it's just making people aware yeah. i think that oh, some sure. of those capabilities are out there and how much money they could really save and, and by virtue of this tech this technology you can now come up with different business plans that will be oh, exactly. useful and tailorable to different people like and we know that the power company here is thinking of the make the make versus buy decision how much do you retain internally how much do you hire out right and uh so we're uh, and we're helping a local company too uh that's forming up uh this aerial inspection to why um they want to basically augment uh, some of the work that HECO's doing and also do other various uh, aerial inspections, but focus on that niche within the market. And they're buying the equipment that they need with the sensors that they need to allow them to be able to do that. And I've uh, been helping them and advising them in the process. So, uh, you know, it's it's great to see these new businesses start up and, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. And that's what it's well, all about. And, it's sustainable another business. example that you, you might want to stress with them, and not so much you, Mike, because you're doing the air stuff, but uh, the study was done and you can use unmanned ground vehicles too and so like for the sh sugar cane plantations and the pineapple fields out there in Hawaii uh, the assessment the study that was done said that if they use GPS autonomous ground systems to like plant their rows harvest their crops but particularly with planting um, that they could save 10 percent increase their their crop by 10% uh, by using very accurate ground-based systems to facilitate their their farming and plantation. Oh, exactly. So, that's, so now we're getting some measurements of the value here, and we have the, the system that generates the value, and we have uh, GIFX as a place to explore and, and, and generate more. We have AVUSI, who's uh, interested in pushing forward and through the foundation for education and the K-12. It's all kind of coming together nicely. It's our job here at this table to keep bringing the story up, keep telling the story, keep getting people on board who will want to talk more about it, and let's uh, hear from people in the outside world. So we're, we're at the point where we have to wrap the show up for the Sounds day good. and wrap the week up here and wrap up Honolulu. But I wanted to thank Dave Place for coming on uh, after hours in your time zone. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. It was great meeting you today. And uh, Dave, say a few words about what you'd like people to take away from this show that are watching it. Oh, I think I, can, uh, I think we've lost Dave. Okay. Mike, let me ask you that question. So, I yeah. just would really uh, like to say thanks again for having us uh, on board. But uh, the technology is uh, screaming ahead, and let's just hope that. Uh, Regulation and the FAA can uh, play some catch up so that we can really employ this stuff sooner than later. Good. Very good. Mike, thanks for coming on. And Dave, thanks. if you're able to watch, thanks for coming on. And we'll see you guys both again some other time. Right. Uh, <laughs> Take care, everybody, and see you next Friday.